This video is brought to you by Nebula. Get all of my videos early and ad-free by following the link in the description. There's a pretty infamous story about the writing of I Am the Walrus. It goes something like this. In 1967, John Lennon received a piece of fan mail from a student at his old secondary school. The student said that an English teacher at the school was teaching Beatles lyrics in class. Never one to turn down a good chance at a prank, Lennon decided that he would write a song so full of nonsense that it would baffle any school teachers trying to analyze it. In his 1968 biography, Hunter Davies says that Lennon was hanging out with his friend Pete Shotton while writing the song. After writing a verse, Lennon is said to have turned to Shotton and said, Let the fuckers work that one out. I think that for some, this quote is enough to write off I Am the Walrus as nothing but nonsense, a musical shit post. But I really don't think that's the case. In fact, I think that I Am the Walrus is a monumental piece of songwriting, not in spite of its nonsense, but because of it. Let's take a closer look. Often when we analyze lyrics, our first instinct is to pick apart the meaning of the words. Which makes sense. Most songs are about one thing or another, either explicitly or implicitly. But lyrics serve a purpose beyond delivering meaning. Song lyrics are themselves musical gestures, expressed using the brilliant instrument that is the human voice. And I think the Beatles understood that better than most. While they did put meaning to their songs, the Lennon-McCartney songwriting formula typically had them building songs from the melody out. And I Am The Walrus is a masterclass in lyrical melody. The song is a veritable parade of earworms, each perfectly populated with surreal phrases that roll easily off the tongue, even without music. I mean, just saying, see how they run like pigs from a gun, feels fun. Same with Semolina Pilchard climbing up the Eiffel Tower. It's a mashup of a number of disparate ideas with no real meaning, but it's genuinely hard to say these lines out loud without adding the bounce of rhythm to them. They've got a nursery rhyme sort of playfulness, and that's no accident. I Am The Walrus was deliberately modeled after children's schoolyard rhymes, a jab at the school teachers who were teaching Lennon's lyrics. This is most blatant in the third verse. Yellow matter custer dripping from a dead dog's eye. Crab locker fishwife, pornographic priestess, boy you've been a naughty girl, you let your knickers down. That first line was adapted from a gross out British playground rhyme. Yellow matter custard, green slop pie, all mixed together with a dead dog's eye. Lennon was a figure who reveled in immaturity. He was a constant joker and spent much of his adult life trying to claw back the innocence and joy that was lacking for large portions of his childhood. It was this search for innocence that drew Lennon to the writings of Lewis Carroll. Both Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Alice Through the Looking Glass had profound influences on Lennon, and that can be felt in the lyrics to I Am the Walrus. Through the Looking Glass prominently features a nonsense poem, Jabberwocky, and there are more direct references too. The walrus itself is a reference to Carol's poem, The Walrus and the Carpenter. In his famous 1980 interview with Playboy, Lennon talked about that poem. To me, it was a beautiful poem. It never dawned on me that Lewis Carroll was commenting on the capitalist and social system. I never went into that bit about what he really meant, like people are doing with the Beatles' work. Later, I went back and looked at it and realized that the walrus was the bad guy in the story, and the carpenter was the good guy. I thought, Oh shit, I picked the wrong guy. I should have said I am the carpenter, but that wouldn't have been the same, would it? In that same interview, Lennon admitted that for all the deliberate nonsense, there were lines that did have meaning behind them. Specifically, Lennon took a jab at Hare Krishna, an Indian spiritual movement that was taking off in the American counterculture at the time. All these people were going about Hare Krishna, Allen Ginsberg in particular. The reference to Elementary Penguin is the elementary, naive attitude of going around chanting Hare Krishna or putting all of your faith in any one idol. I was writing obscurely, a la Dylan in those days. Bob Dylan was a huge influence on Lennon, but Lennon took some umbrage with the crypticism of his lyrics. Now, I personally don't subscribe to the belief that most of Dylan's work was nonsense. I think that Dylan had a great talent at making profound lyrics feel like nonsense until you parsed them. But despite how it may seem, that's not really what's happening with I Am The Walrus. In fact, I think it's the inverse that is happening. Bob Dylan takes profound thoughts and makes them feel like nonsense, whereas John Lennon took nonsense and made it feel profound. 
And that's a task that's just as impressive as Dylan's songwriting. Lennon accomplishes this by loading his song with oblique references that seem to get at the dramatic cultural events happening around Lennon at the time. Corporation t-shirt Stupid Bloody Tuesday, Man You've Been a Naughty Boy You Let Your Face Grow Long, would seem to be a reference to the anti-consumerist hippie movement, while all the many mentions of pigs and policemen draw to mind the growing tension between that movement and the cops. Now, I think the realities of songwriting are more complex than direct intention. The cultural situation around Lennon likely did influence many of the nonsense words he chose for the song, but the police motif was actually born from tamer origins. One day, Lennon was lying around his pool with a friend and he heard sirens going by on the road. They put a melody into his head and he started to match the phrase, Mr. City, Policeman, Sitting, Pretty, to the rhythm. As it happened, that same bouncing rhythm worked well for what might be the one truly profound line in the song. I am he as you are he as you are me and we are all together. That line preaches to the unity and solidarity that the counterculture was trying to push for. Lennon came up with that line after a psychedelic experience, capturing the dissolution of self that such experiences can bring. It seemed to sum up so much of what the hippies were trying to say with their visions of elevated consciousness. It's a bold declaration to open the song, the kind of wisdom that people had started to look to Lennon's lyrics for. And he follows up that deep, profound line by writing lyrics that troll anyone who might dare to look for further profundity. Now, I recognize the irony in me devoting this much time to analyzing lyrics that were designed to baffle and mock people who spend their lives close reading lyrics. But the reality of art is that its creator's intent doesn't tell the whole story. Whatever Lennon meant for I Am The Walrus to be, it wound up as a delightfully transcendent piece of music. Its whimsical nonsense captured the childlike joy erupting at the height of the hippie movement. It celebrated dropping out and rejecting norms, but did so at the expense of people that might take Lennon's work too seriously. Lennon challenged people who worshipped false idols, and that included people's worship of him. Part of Lennon's disdain for the close reading of his lyrics came from the Beatles worship that had emerged at the time. And I think that for him, this was a little jab back, a reminder that he too was human. Really, I think the power of I Am The Walrus was summed up best by George Harrison, who talked about the song to the biographer Hunter Davies in 1968. It's true, but it's still a joke. People looked for all sorts of hidden meanings. It's serious and not serious. And that strange, twisted labyrinth of sincerity and mockery is what makes I Am The Walrus soar. It's a song built mostly around nonsense, but sprinkled with just enough nuggets of meaning that people have questioned it for half a century. And really, I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. John Lennon is one of the most interesting, controversial figures in music history, and this video is really just barely touching the surface of all there is to explore with him. If you're interested in more, you should check out The Ballad of John and Yoko, Lindsay Ellis's latest Nebula original. That video was a deep dive into John Lennon's complicated relationship with Yoko Ono and the fan narratives that sprung up around it. It's an incredible piece of work about our society's treatment of famous women, and it's the exact sort of passion project that Nebula is built for. Nebula is a platform that lets us creators explore without having to do the constant dance of trying to appease the censors, copyright holders, and algorithm. It's let me create more niche videos like my original Polyphonic magazine, it's helped me collaborate on Ghost Notes, my podcast with 12 Tone, and Nebula's even given me the funds to pursue bigger, more ambitious projects like my Dark Side of the Moon project. Beyond all that, it's also just a place where you can watch me and a bunch of other YouTubers with absolutely no ads. Nebula is continuing to grow and experiment, and there's some really cool stuff coming on the horizon. So if you want to check it all out, go to nebula.tv slash polyphonic or use the link in the description. Following that link will get you 40% off an annual plan, which means you can get all my content early and ad-free for about $2.50 a month, and that includes access to my class on how to talk about music. Nebula seriously helps me keep this channel going, so thank you to everybody who already supports it, and hey... Thanks for watching.